hot. <laughs> now for the blessing part of the service, <clears throat> Father Joe Rodriguez is the provincial of the Salvatorians, which means he's the head of the priests and brothers in the United States. There's only about a hundred of us left, and we're aging, some very well, <laughs> others not so well. And some not. <laughs> but there's a hopeful future. Thank you, Joe and Pete. Save JFK Prep. Bring it back, huh? I hear that's how this whole event began. See, I was born and raised in Massachusetts, not far from Hyannis. Even those of us who are not Irish grew up believing that the Kennedys were the Catholic royal family of the United States of America. They even had their own dialect. Uh, Jack, uh, just pack your car and have it ya. And that he did. A royal family that created a dynasty of leaders. And John F. was crowned the prince who gave hope for a new Camelot, hope for the future of our country. Our school was appropriately named in his honor and the motto appro appropriately instituted with that hope, JFK Prep, to lead the land we love, creating a dynasty of leaders. The Salvatorian priests and brothers who founded JFK Prep had a mission to show the goodness and kindness of the Savior to those they taught and cared for. They believed as our founder, Father Francis Jordan, right there, the statue right there. Father Francis Jordan believed that all baptized women and men, lay and religious alike, are called to be apostles. At a time when religious vocations in our land are diminishing, we as Salvatorians have been blessed with a holy problem. This coming fall, we will have 20 men in formation to become Salvatorian priests and brothers. Salvatorians who will become the next Father Melvin, Myron, Greg, Dan, Jude, Brother Bill, Peter, Daryl, you know, Norma Jean, Jim, Fred, and a lot more. They will continue the legacy of JFK Prep in the hope of Camelot Revisited, but in new places, in new faces. If you still feel the momentum, we invite you to consider to adopt an apostle. All right, so check it out, adoptanapostle.com. We are tech savvy, okay? We're with the times. Because that's how the Melvins in our lives were able to respond to their call. Benefactors who believed in them. Where's Gary Head? He never showed up for class and he doesn't show up today. <laughs> and they say people change. Just the other day, I, I asked Father Joe, I said, why don't we spend a Saturday afternoon in a cemetery? Jim asked for our reflection, and it's a once-in-a-lifetime event, which means it can never be repeated. Even a reunion like this can only recall. As much as we would like to recreate or duplicate it, we can't. And therein is what makes it so special. Salvatorian Seminary, or JFK Prep, the first awkward night accompanied with boxes that you never needed before to fill with your clothes, in my case, just try sleeping in a room with 60 guys. It's not easy that first night. If you needed to use the bathroom, the guy with the flashlight would accompany you. I don't recall if he needed to hold it or not, but he accompanied me. <laughs> and rules. Whether it was Salvatorian Seminary or JFK Prep, there were lots of rules. Glorious rules. Glorious rules purely invented to tempt a 15-year-old to cleverly break. And break them we did, one by one. Curfew? Easy. A pillow under a blanket and a geek to cover for you. No smoking, cigarettes in my day, but we created more smoking rooms than there were places to pray. We had classes six days a week. Wednesday and Saturday afternoons were free, which meant a trip to the big city, Manitowoc. But only if you signed up in time. Three hours of unrestricted freedom until we until we return to this unique place. 
Sundays at 1 p.m. we gathered in our study hall to write our letters home about how obediently we were behaving and how life-changing the sacred institution meant to us. And how life-changing? We learned in these old buildings what it means to get along with all kinds of people from all walks of life with different attitudes and behaviors. We were forced to within the confines of these holy acres. Any of us can point to any piece of an anchor of an acre and recall a memory complete with mood, feelings, and music. That old tree near the side entrance to the main building, it's still here. Behind the old theater, when it was there, the corner in the library. The top floor of the monastery that no one was allowed to enter. You kidding? Doug would know a lot of this. If the faculty just said, please visit the top floor whenever you want to, nobody would have gone up there. <laughs> and stay out of the laundry. Yeah, right. In the seminary, the only sports were basketball and track, I think. JFK brought football and other sports, hoping to make us more credible when compared to other schools. But we know there is no comparison. In those days, making a friend with a black person, being from Manitowoc, was unheard of. To hear guys introducing you to all kinds of music happened here. Doug discovered Jimi Hendrix at Salvatore <laughs> and, seven, and he still grieves his death. <laughs> I think they were called albums in those days. The confinement of people and space enforced upon us and called us to get to know each other. Yes, there were still cliques, but even clique guys greeted you in the hallways. Was the school a seminary? A leadership academy, just another prep school. To the St. Nazian's townsfolk, it was a reformatory. <laughs> Those old, very old walls captured youth in route somewhere, but we did not know where. But during this specific time, and what does time mean to a sophomore, in this place, transformations occurred toward adulthood. The seniors treated the freshmen like crap in order that we could treat the lesser like crap in four years. <laughs> That's called bonding. With all with St. Nazians as the enemy, JFK tried to survive. The enemy were those close-minded people, but great bars. JFK was full of open-air youth with no restrictions or barriers. Even adding St. Greg's school to ours did not unite the town and the school. The clash was more than JFK could sustain. Psychologists say that high school is a significant time in a person's life. We don't need to read those articles. We lived it. We measured, weighed, and found it significant. Wait, what's a better descriptor than significant? Propulsion. Salvatorian Seminary and JFK Prep taught and gave us the tools and the weapons, usually in spite of ourselves, to become the men and women we are today. We are grateful, we are thankful. It's a once in a lifetime event, never to be repeated or duplicated, but to be remembered the rest of our lives. And who better to recount some of those things than Pete Eltink, who is fondly remembered by all of us. So Pete. Thank you all. First of all, I want to thank Dave Madden Madigan, <laughs> the man of many names, for the idea of this, and also, even more importantly, for following it through, which is the hard part. Um, we're all grateful. You really nailed it, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to thank Jim and Jeannie. Jeannie's not with us. She had a, a chemo treatment yesterday, and a second the first one of our second series. But Jim and Jeannie have kept us together over the years. And uh, I think we're all really grateful for both of them for their efforts to keep this community alive. Uh, I want to begin today by claiming the right to a bit of poetic license and declare that during the years inscribed on that stone, we were all Salvatorians. And we were all proud members of, many, of what many of us still call the PrEP community. But we're gathered here today to pay tribute to some members of our community who are no longer with us. First, we have to start 
with Father Myron Wagner. It was his idea in the first place. He teamed up with some well-known, nationally known educators from Marquette, and they came up with the idea of starting a school which would be oriented toward leadership, toward service, and towards helping other people. And he went and fought City Hall, because I, I know that because I was at, on City Hall or at City Hall in those days. I was on the administrative team that he bargained with. And then, of course, a few years later, he bargained with me to come and join the administrative team here. Byron, this wouldn't exist without Myron. And we, he had unfortunate problems towards the end of his life, but we all remember him with a lot of love and respect. If Myron was the father of PrEP, Norma Jean Borman was the mother. In the early days, when she and Rosalie were the only full-time women on the staff, it was up to her, especially, to change this former all-male bastion into a place that could become fertile ground to develop, to develop strong, smart women. And all you gotta do is look around to know that she succeeded. We remember Ma Shad and Brother Fabes. They didn't know Maslow or self-actualization from the hole in the ground, <laughs> but they knew about meatloaf and dust mops, and they had very strong ideas about how young people should behave. And they never hesitated to let us know when we were out of line. And I say us because it wasn't just students. As far as they were concerned, the students, the teachers, the administrators, the staff, all of us were just a bunch of, of uh, unruly kids who had to be, who needed loving watching over. And we remember them very fondly too. Father Melvin, who certainly loved all of us very, very much and especially loved the environment we were all in. Most of us have good memories of what used to stand right next to us here, the fabled eco house that got so much publicity in those days, which is all gone now, of course. Shriver. <laughs> My God, what can I say about Shriver? He loudly, often very loudly, sometimes even maybe a little profanely, <laughs> believed and in excellence, in excellence in academic, athletics, and especially personal excellence. And he insisted that we all be excellent, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. Brother Bill, oh Lord, Brother Bill prayed for us every morning, every student, every faculty member. He prayed that he would find a, he would toast, tell me he would, keep, when he would walk, he'd always keep his eyes on the ground because he thought he was going to find a 10 karat diamond that would fund uh, JFK prep for eternity. <laughs> but I think mostly what we remember about Brother Bill was the big grin on his face when he made the wheels on the bus go round and round. He was a, a, a very lovely man. <clears throat> And, uh, and it contributed so much to us. Steve Reichelt, who was the art teacher, who tried to awaken in us the notion that gay people should also be included in the list of folks who should be treated fairly and equitably. And Steve died awful early too. Marty, the legend, his biographer, Subtitle his book, The Man Who Refused to Punt. Because even if it was fourth and a furlong, fourth down was not an opportunity to give the ball to the enemy. Fourth down was just another chance to score a touchdown, so you go for it. You don't give up. And he never gave up on any of us. And I remember him as being so loyal to each of us. Thank you. Okay. Bunny, I want to remember student. I'm very proud of all of you alums. So many of you ended up 
devoting your per your professional lives to the service of others, just the way Byron and the others had in mind. I know there are doctors, nurses, shamans, lawyers, teachers, advocates, social workers, and just plain good, good neighbors. And so many, virtually everybody that I have followed with after I was here for those six years is in some sort of service frame of mind and helping others. In 1999, I was in the middle of a two-week game of phone tag with one of my former advisees, and we lost one of our alums. We remember her as Ingrid White. She died at the age of 41, known to his friends, to her friends, family, and the world as Ingrid Washington Watuk Al Isa. She had dedicated, she was known as Flying Eagle Woman to the Menominee people. She dedicated herself and then ultimately was martyred for the cause of freedom and equality for indigenous peoples, especially women. She was the executive director of a foundation in New York known as the Fund for the Four Directions. We stayed in touch off and on over the years, Ingrid and I, whether she lived on the res, as she called it, or when she lived in Cuba, which was a very interesting time because it couldn't, we used to be interesting ways to try to communicate in a way that was not exactly legal in those days, or at the end when she was living in New York. She gained national attention and prominence. She served on several committees of the United Nations. She received the Frederick Douglass Award one year and was a fellow of the Rockefeller Foundation's Next Generation Leadership Program, among other, uh, other honors, including the National Council of Churches and many Native American group, groups. She shed her blood into the soil of Columbia trying to help the Uwa Indians in their struggle against the ethnic cleansing movement that the government was carrying on in those days. The fingers don't work too good anymore. I believe Marty would agree that she didn't punt on fourth down, she went for it. And I believe that Myron would have said, no, that's what I had in mind. I thank you all for allowing me to remember out loud for a few minutes today. And I'd like to end with a quote from a musical. I can't sing like Father Joe, so I'll just <laughs> say it. And uh, it may seem a bit corny to some of <clears throat> some people. I warned Jim and Jeannie that I get emotional over prep. My kids were born here. I formed friendships that have lasted 40 years. And that's all something very special. I guess you just maybe had to be there. The quote is from a musical. Each morning, each evening, from December to December, before you drift asleep upon your cot, think, ba think back on all the tales that you remember of Camelot. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. That's my memory of JFK Prep. Thank you for listening.